and then we're going to get going, but we are recording. I don't know why. Oh yeah, she's got it recorded in there too. Okay, so we're going to about, about two more minutes. I'm going to go ahead and get started and then we'll um, put some introductions and then you all have, I know you have a lot of information to cover, so I, I don't want to talk as uh, that long because I want to make sure you get that out. So it's about 103. We'll wait to 105 and then we'll get going. I don't want to talk as long because I want to make sure you get that out. So it's about 103. We'll wait till Alrighty, about one more minute and we'll get started. I know a lot of people are interested in hearing this topic today, so I'm excited to have our guests share as much as they can about this particular topic. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start. It is 105, and I see Dr. Shonda Amber Phillips has joined us. She's. I'm um, going to do some introductions real quick, and then I'll leave a, read a statement, and then we'll we'll continue on. So, my name is Roberta McWoods. I am a um, retired teacher in the Kirkwood School District, also the master mentor for teachers of color, and um, I'm proud to to be one of the moderators of this. Um, Second week now of our Kirkwood Educational Equity Speaker Series. We have two phenomenal speakers this week at, um, today that I, I know it's a lot of buzz about their topic, so I won't talk a, a whole lot. Um, I'm gonna get out of the way in a few minutes and be handling some chat questions near the end. Um, but Dr. Shonda Ambers Phillips, would you like to say a few words as a moderator as well? Sure, um, first I'm so excited about this opportunity. I'm excited as Roberta said to hear this presentation. Um, I actually facilitate the Educational Equity Task Force at the district office and one of the initiatives of the Educational Equity Task Force is that we will learn from others. And so the, the speaker series certainly affords us an opportunity to do that. And we also want to engage our community to build shared ownership and responsibility for the success of all of our students. And so um, the Educational Equity Task Force started in around 1990 and it continues to go on. As long as there's inequity in our district for any of our students, we will continue to do this work. So we're excited to have you here and engaged in this conversation. And um, thanks for allowing me an opportunity to just share a little bit about the Educational Equity Task Force. Great. So our statement that we established back um, in the winter um, the purpose of the Kirkwood Educational Equity Speaker Series is to provide a safe space for Kirkwood School District staff, students, and school community to have a courageous conversations around systemic racism that affects Black, Indigenous, and students of color with the objectives of increasing equity for Black and Brown students and closing the opportunity gap. It is our hope that participants become enlightened, inspired, and more self-aware as we work to improve the lives of all students through the enhancement of social, emotional, economic, civic, and educational outcomes. I'm gonna to present to you um, Dr. Jeff Ward 
from Washington University who has a very extensive background in African and African American history, as well as um, working with the Reparative Justice Coalition of St. Louis. And he is partnered today with Shiraz Gorman, who I have to say is a former athlete of mine. I'm so impressed with her, who is a poet and activist and has been involved in this work for a while now. And she also partners with uh, Jeff in the Reparative Justice Coalition of St. Louis. So I'm going to turn it over to you two for this wonderful presentation today. Well, thank you. Uh, good to be with you all. My name is Jeff Ward. And, <clears throat> um, and as was mentioned, I've been doing a lot of work for many, many years now on, on the racial politics of social control. And, and so, and I've been working with Shiraz here in St. Louis for the past year or so. Um, on some uh, common interests, including the work we're doing in the Reparative Justice Coalition of St. Louis, which I'll, uh, I think we'll say more about at some point today. I thought I would get us started by just unpacking the title of this session a little bit, um, and specifically unpacking the idea of cultural violence and how it relates to white supremacy. And then um, Shiraz and I will both uh, unpack that further with some examples of how these manifest and, and, and how they can be addressed. So in terms of uh, the idea of cultural violence, I think it's important, you know, when you use the word violence in our uh, society, people tend to think immediately of a very specific kind of violence, namely um, direct violence or physical violence. But in fact, violence comes in many forms and these forms are interrelated. So uh, in addition to physical or bodily uh, violence that is directed at the body and physically harmful, injurious, uh, there are problems of structural violence and problems of cultural violence. And uh, just briefly, structural violence refers generally to the organization of the society in such a way that certain populations are systematically harmed. You can think about our educational systems, our healthcare systems, housing, other social systems that have been designed in such a way that so certain populations are injured by their way in, in the way that they are designed. So, for example, certain populations are made more vulnerable to chronic illness um, or to unemployment, and 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 those are harms attending to the structural violence of our society. Another form of violence is described as cultural violence. And cultural violence refers to uh, a, a kind of harm or injustice rooted in social patterns of representation, interpretation and communication, or how we represent reality or truth. Um, uh, our values can be sites of, of, of uh, uh, essentially reflective of the cultural violence of our society. Representational harms take forms such as, uh, or what I'm calling cultural violence, takes form, take forms including cultural domination. So being subjected to patterns of interpretation and communication that are associated with another culture and, and alien or hostile to one's own. That is a, a, a kind of aggression that is cultural in form uh, and that is injurious in the sense that it imposes, uh, uh, that it alienates one's own culture. Another example is non-recognition or being rendered invisible via the authoritative representational or communicative and interpretive practices of one's culture. So not seeing one's group represented in places like media um, or in the memorial landscape. The fact that there are virtually no uh, uh, memorial, very few memorials uh, across the U.S. Uh, honoring black women, for example, as an example of non-recognition uh, uh, relative to, say, the recognition of white men on the memorial landscape. So that's another example of cultural um, uh, violence. And finally, uh, disrespect, the being routinely maligned or disparaged and stereotypic public cultural representations and or in everyday life is a, another form of cultural violence. Uh, that is again injurious in its representational work. Um, uh, all of these practices are involve constructions of meaning 
that are harmful in the sense that they uh, 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 that they subject certain groups to a kind of um, uh, an othering that can oftentimes involve dehumanization or at the very least a sort of framing as undeserving of uh, the same civil and human rights considerations as other groups are entitled to. I'll give you one last example of this, which is a form of disrespect as racist jokes or sexist jokes or jokes that are at once racist and sexist. And, and what those jokes do in the form of humor, uh, humorous, technically humorous discourse is they define populations in stereotypic terms and oftentimes will um, rationalize the, um, they de dehumanize populations and thus rationalize the withholding of human and civil rights um, uh, protections. So when we, you know, we decided to title this session, The Cultural Violence of White Supremacy, to sort of um, be explicit about how what we wanted to, our, our intention of, of explaining why it is people are so deeply concerned with things like monuments and memorials today, um, the renaming of places, and in what sense should we consider these harmful? The last thing I will say, just to come back to this point about these different forms of violence, is that they are all interconnected. So a police department, like Ferguson Police Department, which was dis discovered by the Justice Department to be circulating racist jokes, the police department circulating and court system circulating racist jokes about African-American constituents is uh, uh, far more likely to engage in practices of structural violence, like over policing and under protection in black communities, um, as well as physical violence, like uh, excessive use of force, including lethal force when in interacting with black civilians, having you know, genocide scholars write about the role, the, dis the, the discursive work of splitting that is always present in the context of genocide where a certain population is split off from the society in terms of the sort of moral sensibility split off from the moral universe and thus framed as um, deserving uh, of the uh, hostility, the exclusion, the violence that they become subject to. So this is what we're talking about in terms of the cultural violence of white supremacy. We could, you know, cultural violence is also re uh, relevant to um, things like sexism and homophobia Islamophobia, et cetera. Uh, but in our conversation today, we want to focus on uh, cultural violence as a form of racial violence. And I'll turn it over now to um, Shiraz, who will develop one ex uh, case illustration, and I'll come back with another. Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm actually going to share my screen at this moment. Um, and I will be actually showing the ad case for this um, around how we perpetuate cultural violence um, in what seems to be the harmless, um, the harmless industry of advertising and media. So I like to start off um, with the definition of advertising. The act or practice of calling public attention to one's product, service, need, et cetera, especially paid announcements in newspapers and magazines over radio or television, or on billboards, et cetera. And I post this definition up because I want us to consider what is advertising and what isn't advertising, who is an advert advertiser and who isn't an advertiser. Um, because it would be, it's most shocking for po most people to know that our news programs, um, all of that is supported by ad dollars. Um, so when you even take a look at what's being placed before us on our evening news or our daytime news, um, we must continue to ask our ourselves this question, what is being advertised to us in this moment? So I will start off with this first image. And this image clearly shows the violence that was used um, towards Black children. And something as innocent as we look at bathroom products, right? 
in this ad, um, this is for Piccaninny Freeze. And a lot of people, um, when we start looking at the year of 1920, we're looking at post-World War I, um, what happened is that we had this thing called like the sugar boom, where candy became associated with holidays like Easter and Christmas, um, because sugar was pretty inexpensive before, well, it was expensive before World War I, but post-war, um, you know, the price of sugar dropped and all of a sudden, you know, folks had to figure out what to do. Um, the rise of candy had everything to do with racialized images, um, very grotesque images of, of the black body and particularly black children. Um, in this particular image, you will see that it is a pretty distorted, grotesque um, image of a young black girl eating a piece of watermelon, which we all know that historically, you know, watermelon has been used, you know, as this type of weapon towards Black people. And this soap ad by the Pear Company. Um, and the Pear Company is really interesting um, because the Pear Company, as you can see in this image, um, just this whole notion of asserting that black people are dirty and that their soap um, could whiten the body. Um, the ad, there is also an ad by the pair company that is titled actually The White Man's Burden. Um, and that ad literally features a white male standing at a sink and kind of lamenting about the dirtiness um, of black body people, people of African. and a very violent image that is from um, a historic company in Australia, the Nula Nula um, Soap Company, where it states it will knock the dirt off of the head and you see kind of like these spoons that are surrounding the image. Um, and they even went so far as to do some CSA in this particular ad where they have the word dirt literally um, on type of this, you know, necklace around, once again, the display of a black woman now um, around the neck. And advertising went all the way into just record sales. A lot of American music actually started with minstrelsy. So just when you look at the titles, um, the Piccaninny Rag, and the depictions of Black people. And the language that was used around, we know at this particular time in history that Black people were not creating any of these ads, let alone being the writers. So you see these caricatures um, of Black people um, being used as kind of like these docile servant figures. Um, and the dialect at the time um, being used. And I'll pause right here for a moment. We're going to go into a bit about Aunt Jemima um, because as we know, post the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, we've seen like this big push now um, on racist iconography um, that's been used in sports culture, all the way through um, to the brands that we use in everyday life. So this is actually from a popular music piece um, called Jemima's Wedding Day. And how this evolved into the brand of Aunt Jemima. Um, and there's now a push for the legacy of Nancy Green to be recognized. Actually, the family is suing for $2 billion because they took the image of this Black woman to kind of, to continue to push this notion of being subservient um, to white people. Um, and kind of this, not kind of, but this figure of the jovial, happy to serve, um, Black woman that is directly from the mammy trope. So I will also 
talk a bit about um, her legacy because it is stated that she was the one that actually created this brand, this the actual pancake flour, and then how it got co-opted. She remained the image of it, but then white business folks, primarily white men, stepped in um, and took over and just used her image to put out this notion of black servitude. And also, I will speak a little bit about, interestingly enough, because um, his last name is Green as well, um, Nathan Green, who is the previously enslaved man who actually um, helped Jack Daniels. He actually gave Jack Daniels the formula to the whiskey brand. And how, when we look at cultural violence and the stripping of wealth of Black creators and inventors, you know, such as the case of Aunt Jemima, um, and how that is its own type of violence as well. And some of us are familiar with a lot of these ads um, that went out for escaped enslaved people. And here, um, I wanted to bring in D.W. Griffin's Birth of a Nation, because for me, as an advertising professional, this was probably one of the longest form ads of its day to um, put forward and to reinforce this myth that during the Reconstruction era, that black men were a threat to a white woman's purity and her safety. And we actually see this still existing to this day um, where the threat of rape um, by black men towards white women um, are just being a, a physical threat. Um, is still very present with us today. And this is something that an American president signed off on. Actually, Birth of the Nation, Birth of the Nation was the first film ever shown in the White House. And interestingly enough, um, he was actually the creator of Birth of a Nation, Mr. Thomas Dixon Jr., was actually a classmate of Woodrow Wilson. So, and this is a still image. And mind you, none of the actors in Birth of a Nation were people of African descent. They were actually all white male actors um, in blackface. And for me, this is, you know, on top of a lot of images out of that film, for me, this is the one that continues to resonate historically because it has impacted our imaginations um, in a way to where this myth gives us a very visceral reaction and conjures real fear inside of people. However, this image was created by the white imagination. And to show you how just damaging this is, is that Woodrow Wilson stated, the white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into an existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a venerable empire of the South to protect Southern country. And then we all know about blackface. And this was also, you know, an ad that went out. And this is the modern day version of it. Because a lot of us tend to think that oh, these ads are old, they're in the past, they no longer have an impact on us, which my argument is that is not true. These stereotypes, these tropes, this type of violence and harm continues to this day. And it is global. And as we all saw in 2019 um, with the black face shirt that mimicked you know, Sambo, which was done by Gucci. Um, and this particular ad 
which harkens back to the pair company and several other soap companies and personal care um, ads that came out. This was done within the last three years by Dove. And while Dove attempted to apologize for this ad, um, for a lot of people, their apology was a moot point because if you ever want to just take a moment um, and look up ads for Unilever, which is the parent company of Dove, um, there is a product that they have called Fair and White. Um, and this product is primarily sold in India where you can literally look at the print ads and they show this gradient of a person of Indian descent who is dark skinned and you, what we call in advertising, you use kind of like this trilogy method of showing over time um, how this product lightens the skin and it goes from this darker skinned Indian woman having a scowl on her face to her gradually smiling as her skin becomes lighter. And this has done a lot of psychological harm, um, not only here in the US, but it goes to show that anti-Blackness actually gets exported all over the world. And this was a PlayStation ad. Um, hands down, probably one of the most um, violent images that has come out in most recent times, uh, where it literally states, white is coming. And you just can see visually um, the aggression and the threat um, of harm in this image. Another modern image, um, which is extremely disturbing because the headline reads, multiply, multiply computing performance and maximize the power of your employees where you have these people of African descent kneeling essentially before this white male um, in a button down shirt in khakis. So this ad um, for me, when it came out, as a copywriter, I one, I was just completely irritated because you could just tell that um, they just did not know what, uh, what would be the most offensive headline to go with. So they picked two um, and it reads, look like you give a damn, re-civilize yourself. And this image, um, this actually was a very large billboard um, that was in New York that said the most dangerous place for an African American is in the womb. And it was a part of an anti-abortion ad. And this was the one that kind of blew the lid off of everything in the most recent years. Um, where H&M, um, a company that, you know, was doing somewhat okay in the market, um, decided to really go there with the racial stereotypes. And the young black man shirt reads, coolest monkey in the jungle. And the white young man shirt says, survival expert. However, it's more so the look of fear in the young white man's eyes, the little boy, uh, where he is just shaken visibly. And how, when you think about visual literacy and how we are taught to see and how our eyes focus on things, um, with the young black man, well, black boy looking into at us directly just with this stern look. Um, it is meant to give us a certain um, feeling about how we should even feel about black children and their innocence. 
And if we think, and my apologies because this got a little cut, if we think that this is not currently going on, um, I was unable to pull an image of this, but Volkswagen had to recently apologize for a spot that they released on their Instagram and Twitter. And this spot literally showed um, a miniature size kind of black person walking next to this car and a large white hand coming in and flicking the individual um, into a restaurant called Petit Colono, and which translates from French into little colonist or little settler. Um, so these are things that are still very much going on today in the advertising landscape that reinforces, you know, just cultural harm, which then, you know, perpetuating stereotypes that actually do lead to physical harm of people of African descent. So I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I will turn it back around to Jeff. Thank you. So let's pivot now and talk about memorials and monuments. I'm going to use the term uh, memorial landscape or commemorative landscape just to emphasize that our landscape is literally covered with um, objects that are meant to um, facilitate public memory, memory of events, memory of people, um, and, and in, in each of these cases, uh, memorials are communicating, they're engaging in this representational work, similar to advertisements. They're engaging in this representational work by um, sort of defining for us what matters or how, how we should remember something or what we should remember. And uh, by implication, uh, what we should forget. Um, so, so this is why the commemorative landscape is so contested lo locally, nationally, globally. It has always been and always will be because it is a place where we communicate our values as a society and, um, and, and we use memorials to relate to, to, to transfer those values intergenerationally. So let me figure out, I don't, I don't quite know how to do this screen. I know how to share my screen, but I don't know how to share it in PowerPoint. I'm gonna see what happens when I do this. Um, all right, let me see here. Uh, so if I push presentation mode, let's see what happens, all right. Can you see this first slide? Okay. Um, so just for some framing again, when we think, well, what are memorials? Pictured here is the Confederate War Memorial established by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, um, not in 1993. This photo is from 1993. It was established earlier in the 20th century, long after the Civil War. Uh, and it was just removed in 2017. But I just use it here to um, evoke the, 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 the contestation of Confederate memory, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. But the thing I wanna stress here is that memorials really, we should think of them as sort of involving a number of things at once. One is that memorials are um, texts. They're, they tell stories. And, and so the, the, the cultural violence of memorials the disrespect, the non-recognition, the erasure, oftentimes happens literally in the form of the story, either through what the monument says or the stories that are absent from our memorial landscape, like the story of Mill Creek Valley, for example, or the story of the lynching of Francis McIntosh in downtown St. Louis, which is one of the cases we're working on in the Reparative Justice Coalition. The story of how East St. Louis impacted St. Louis. Um, uh, all those are stories, are texts that are not part of our commemorative landscape, uh, sort of subject to this erasure. But oftentimes people are contesting the, literally what the, the memorial or monument says or conveys in terms of meaning. 
A second meaning, a second way of reading memorials is, is that understanding that they constitute arenas. They constitute politically charged spaces that um, people can then leverage to make certain kinds of claims. Claims around, for example, uh, a demand for equal justice. So this memorial in Forest Park became a charged site, a, a space charged with political energy for the presence of this memorial. Um, people would not have mobilized in this space without that memorial there to animate their grievances and, um, and facilitate the mobilization. Memorials are oftentimes performative, literally performance works themselves. Um, a, a great example of this, if you, uh, you should look up, is the uh, slave rebellion reenactment in New Orleans that has occurred um, recently where uh, hundreds of people joined in reenacting a massive uprising of enslaved people in modern day uh, uh, New Orleans in its vicinity uh, to commemorate the, the, um, the resilience of the enslaved population, the self-determination, the struggle for freedom to commemorate these aspects of the history of slavery in this country. And finally, memorials are analyzed in relation to the idea of wounds. Memorials um, can themselves wound or injure, as we've been talking about uh, this, this afternoon, but they can also be sites of wound dressing or healing of, of wounds. And it's so a lot of what's happening now in the commemorative landscape is really an attempt to use monuments and memorials to engage in uh, addressing legacies of, of racial violence and dismantling white supremacy. The work that Monument Lab, for example, has been doing with Pulitzer Arts Foundation in St. Louis and a number of other partners, uh, which by the way, they'll be uh, speaking, there'll be next week, there'll be a series of events at Pulitzer Arts that'll be virtual, you're all, um, invited and if you're interested i can send you more information about that but there's a lot of this wound dressing work happening in this city and around the world this is a photo from bristol england um, from several years ago where people were protesting again in the background you can see this um, uh, statue of a man named colston who was a wealthy um, philanthropist and civic leader whose wealth was based in uh, his practice of enslavement and so people have mobilized against the veneration of this perpetrator of uh, crimes against humanity and arguing that this monument as a text is not aligned with the commitments to human and civil rights um, uh, that the populace uh, wishes to express today. So they demanded that it come down. I believe it is one of those that has since been toppled um, in recent um, weeks and months in the wake of the global uprising um, against white supremacy that uh, the George Floyd killing uh, 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 reignited. The, uh, the, the other thing about this image that I, why, why I wanna stress it is that it illustrates how the, the monument becomes an arena for political discourse. And you see people gathering around in a space to make claims on the state and each other about um, uh, the idea of equal justice. I just wanna share a number of other examples of the memorial landscape past and present and, and to uh, just mostly to point out how ubiquitous the commemorative objects we're, I'm talking about are and also their contestation. The first image in the upper um, left corner, this black and white image is of an exhibit that was in Forest Park during the 1904 World's Fair called the Colossus of Cotton. This was in the Mississippi House, which was, um, which was positioned roughly around where the zoo is today in, in Forest Park. And in that space, you had this enormous sculpture made of cotton, a white a depiction of a white man with a crown on, uh, made entirely of cotton, who's lording over these um, life-size African-American sculptures that are described as uh, cotton pickers. And this is in 1904. 
decades after uh, the, uh, the, the technical end of slavery, and there is this commemoration happening in St. Louis of, uh, 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 of the cotton planters and their wealth built on enslavement. Uh, it's an example of how cultural violence plays out in a sort of artistic, creative form. Even, a, even an, a, 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 like an ephemeral exhibition that was uh, the Mississippi House at the 1904 World's Fair. Another example is immediately below that still stands today is this intersection in, um, in uh, St. Louis County, West County, I think out by um, Chesterfield, where uh, you have a road called Old Slave Road that um, is, a, is an area where historically enslaved uh, African-Americans and free African-Americans and descendants of enslaved African-Americans have lived. And the name, the road was named uh, uh, Old Slave Road because of the presence of this black population. Black residents in that area have recently petitioned the city to change the road name uh, to a name more befitting and more, uh, uh, and, and more respectful of the resident black population. And the city council um, voted against that name change, notwithstanding the uh, pleadings of residents who, who are asserting that this is injurious uh, to us. In the middle of the screen is a, um, a sort of representation of the, uh, the opposition to Confederate memorials. This one's from Louisville, Kentucky, I believe where uh, uh, populations that are, have simply, you know, uh, uh, no longer waiting for the government to act in, um, in engaging what South Africans call visual redress in terms of these memorial sites have taken it upon themselves uh, by defacing memorials and often as we've seen in the news also removing them. Um, in the upper right corner is a, drawing that one of my kids, eight-year-old Javier, made the other day in his virtual art class, uh, his virtual art camp class. And this class happened to take place on Juneteenth last month. And um, I share it here because it's an interesting example of, again, the kind of uh, quotidian nature, the everyday nature of our memory work. And, and, and how also I share, because I know I'm gonna, uh, speaking with a group of educators uh, and perhaps students, that this is an example of how in an educational context, um, cultural violence can play out. So the assignment, the, 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 the task in this uh, drawing class was to make one of these cakes celebrating St. Louis's um, 256 or whatever years. And, and, at the bottom of the cake, the teacher said to the class, and this was a group of mostly kindergartners, my second grader was kind of crashing the class with his kindergartner brother. But um, uh, the teacher said, well, everyone write St. Louis 256 years at the bottom of your cake. And, and I'm sitting there, you know, I do work on histories of racial violence and legacies. And I'm, I'm looking at my, my, son, my sons and I had talked about Juneteenth that morning and what is Juneteenth? Why is it important? And so I'm thinking, what do, you know, this is a virtually all white group, white teacher, all white kids. I'm thinking, why are they having us commemorate 250 years of a city in a slave state on Juneteenth when the first hundred or so of those years, um, for the first hundred or so of, of those years, St. Louis, practiced uh, enslavement. And, and so there was this sort of uncritical engaged commemoration of the history of the city in that moment. And so what we did is turn our cake into a happy Juneteenth cake. And then I wrote a little note to the teacher explaining that we did that and suggesting that she consider this next time around. But it's an example of, uh, and she was responsible, you know, she was um, appreciative of the intervention and, and um, you know, of course gave the, um, the requisite, I didn't mean to, and you know, all that stuff. But uh, uh, it's an example of how, you know, uh, 
memory work, like critically engaging the 250 year history of St. Louis is important, particularly for some populations uh, for whom that 250 years is really, is, is, is quite fraught, uh, especially on a day like Juneteenth. And finally, the bottom right is an example of a project. It's really to illustrate two things. One is this, this plaque that you can barely see, you can't read, is almost hidden, commemorates the Crispus Attic School that was um, created for black children in Jim Crow St. Louis. And this was the school, the segregated black school in St. Louis before Brown v. Board of Education forced the integration of St. Louis schools. Uh, St. Louis high school students, I can't remember what school they were from, uh, came together to commission and design this memorial object, this plaque that is at the site of the former Crispus Attic School. Um, so I'm sharing it for that reason as an example of memory work and really a black memory work, but I'm also sharing it to show how cultural violence can also play out in the design of memory work. And in this case, you have this, um, what appears to be an almost in, in, um, intentional effort to, um, uh, you've probably talked about microaggressions. This is a, like a microaggressive intervention in the landscape where they put this label of the corporate building, the Bonham Place office building, right on top of the plaque honoring Christmas Attic School outside of the entrance to the parking lot. Um, this is a clearly an area that has very little pedestrian traffic. It's a busy driveway. Um, there's no effort really to elevate this commemorative effort. Really, the effort seems instead to um, focus on suppressing it um, or to disregarding it. It is an example in the landscape of disrespect. Um, and so I share it for that reason as well. One other uh, example, and then I want to talk about a class I, I'm, I'm teaching now at WashU, and I would invite um, folks to join us in. And, uh, and this example comes from downtown Clayton, where um, in 1955, the State Historical Society of Missouri and the Highway Commission um, erected historical markers in every Missouri County. And this was the marker for St. Louis County. The first line of it reads, quote, the county was first visited by white colonists when, and it goes on to describe a sort of settlement story of St. Louis County. Um, I, on, as a representative of the Rep Reparative Justice Coalition of St. Louis, recently appealed to the city of Clayton and St. Louis County to remove and or amend this marker in part for its degradation of equal protection under law. I'm a resident of Clayton. Uh, I, I expressed my, I mean, when I, I moved to St. Louis two years ago, I was telling Roberta yesterday we spoke, um, you know, I do historical work. I saw this historical marker. Well, one of the first days I was in town and I was just astounded by this um, very explicit framing of the county as a white place. And so right then I was committed to making it my business to trouble this sign and, and, and hopefully see it removed and amended. Part of what's troubling about the sign, again, relating to its, its, its the larger landscape and how it's positioned is the building behind it is the headquarters of the St. Louis police, uh, County Police Department. So in my petition to the city of Clayton and the county, I argue that this sign by framing the county as a white place uh, degrades equal protection under law, degrades my access to equal protection under law, that of my family and other people of color, um, because it reinforces the idea that St. Louis is fundamentally a white place. Uh, the mayor of Clayton and St. Louis County Executive have both recently pledged to review how the memorial landscape of these uh, jurisdictions align aligned with commitments to equal justice. You know, we wait to see how that effort unfolds, but we will, as the Reparative Justice Coalition and others will be doing our part to ensure that this, um, that this does not simply result in yet another report or uh, a review, but instead, uh, but also resorts, results in um, 
in uh, actual practices of visual, visual redress. Um, so the last thing I want to share with you is from my uh, a class I teach. And let's see how we're doing on time here. Um, uh, I'll just briefly share, and I'll put a link to this in the chat, but I'll briefly want to share that um, that uh, I've been teaching a class at WashU for the past two years on on uh, <clears throat> that I call monumental anti-racism, and the, the focus of the class is, is to um, is to is, is really to engage in a, uh, a, a an assessment of uh, global efforts to uh, global sort of uh, examples of anti-racist memory work. This image you see in the background is of the um, National Memorial of Peace and Justice in, in Montgomery, Alabama otherwise known as the lynching memorial. But what we're doing in this project, and I wanted to share it because I know you are working with students and uh, or some of you may be students working on projects. And what we're doing in this, in this class is really two things. One is to build a collaborative database of, of comm commemorative projects that are actively engaged in the disavowal of white supremacy, um, not shown on this map now, or all of the examples of this that are happening as we speak around the world today, we'll be working on adding those to the map this fall. This summer, we've been working on adding sites of conscience related to enslavement, many of which are in the Caribbean and um, uh, West Africa and Europe, and those will be on the map soon. Uh, and so my students work with me to build this database that populates this map. I can tell you more about that. And then finally, uh, they work to develop their own commemorative project idea. So one student proposed, who's from St. Charles, black woman from St. Charles proposed, proposed the development of a freedom trail honoring Archer Alexander, formerly enslaved in St. Charles, escaped to St. Louis, uh, where he was aided in part by the president of Wash U. Another student who's a uh, uh, Chinese American student is interested in Chinese exclusion acts and proposed an intervention at the Golden Spike National Historic Park related to the Transcontinental Railroad and how Chinese laborers literally built this country um, and its economic power. Um, and the final example I'll give is a proposal to engage in visual redress on WashU's campus around the Olympic rings that were installed in 2018. Olympic rings that commemorate selectively the 1904 Olympics, which were part of the World's Fair, but, it, but cite, erase the history of uh, racism, the, the racism of those Olympic games, that um, uh, because those 1904 Olympics are notorious for this uh, component of the games called Anthropology Days that were meant literally to demonstrate the superiority of white people by caricaturing um, non-white uh, uh, populations that were also exhibited literally at the um, World's Fair. So we're working, we're pressuring the university to engage in a more honest telling of our role relationship as a university to the 1904 um, games. So I think we're almost out of time. I think I would uh, just stop there and, and uh, thank you and then open up for Dialogue. Yeah, wow, that was, uh, I'm sitting here and thinking about all the things that, uh, I live five minutes from Clayton, and you know, things, everyday things that we walk around and that we don't even pay attention to, that we need to pay attention to. And that's one of my questions. I know Shonda has one, and there was also one in the chat, maybe we'll get to in the next few minutes or so, is that how do you, how do parents and how do teachers teach children and students to be aware of, uh, those kinds of things that we see in the media and monuments, you know, what's, what's the role of the parent or the teacher to try to start teaching some of those things and let them uh, be able to see that those images uh, are, are false. Any suggestions? Well, I answered um, that question in the chat, but I'll go ahead and, you know, give my perspective to the larger group. Um, 
one, parents and educators need to confront their own bias and racism first, um, because children and students cannot unpack images um, with people who have their own bias and racist belief systems. Because what we what that results in is an explaining away um, of the images, or you know, quite honestly, reinforcing the stereotypes. You know, so my perspective is that a lot of anti-racism work um, and a lot of homework needs to be done on the parent and educators' part before they interact with the students. Because quite honestly, a lot of children, we don't give children enough credit. You know, kid logic is amazing. They will call some things out and out of this fear um, of not wanting to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. You know, grown folks have a tendency to kind of shut children down you know, or just to go back and say, well, that was then, and this is our culture, and this is our heritage, and that's that's where it stops, and that's extremely harmful. Right. Um, there are a couple, I know uh, Dr. Shonda Amber-Sillows had one. There's a couple on the chat. I don't know if you all can see that. Mm -hmm. um, That's the one at the top. Can you describe the work of the Reparative Justice Coalition and how they or you choose and prioritize your work? And so I know you both are intimately involved in that. So just more um, information, I guess, is wanted about the Reparative Justice Coalition. Um, let me just say quickly about that. You know, we're a coalition of, of uh, residents from the city county who are who are broadly committed to um, acknowledging and addressing how histories of racial violence continue to impact our region. And, you know, we our, our immediate focus really is to uh, form a community remembrance project um, in partnership with Equal Justice Initiative. And so some of your, some of the audience members may be aware that Equal Justice Initiative, in addition to establishing this national memorial, has challenged count local communities to form local community remembrance projects that um, reckon, you know, um, uh, engage in commemorative work related to histories of racial terror in our own communities. And the main thing that brought, the, the sort of thing that initiated our formation of this coalition was to create a, compare, a community remembrance project in St. Louis. And that'll be something that we focus on um, uh, you know, that's one of the things we're going to focus on primarily. But the but beyond that, you know, it's a it's a coalition that is that doesn't uh, it's not hierarchical in nature. You know, we we come together. Anyone's welcome to join, and and we just talk about what what are some things we can work on. What are what what capacity do we have to do these things? We are a relatively new group, so there isn't a. Um, a really rigid long list of priorities um, other than completing our, our proposal for community remembrance project, which we think will be done in the next few weeks. And there are a number of other things that we're interested in. I mean, Shiraz and I were talking yesterday about the wanting to push for um, a deeper investment in sort of infrastructure of black um, uh, heritage uh, work, you know, history, Museum and art museums, and so better support for those institutions and connections among them. We're not only focused on, you know, um, addressing problems, uh, sort of the the, the um, removing injurious objects, um, but also really thinking about you know how can we engage in public memory that will be. Um, likely to produce the better society we all want to live in. I saw another question on here about, uh, this relates in some ways to what I was saying about the coalition. Uh, Jessica asked about incorporating di different perspectives. And it's a very important point. You know, we're, we're as I said, the coalition is open to uh, everyone. I'm a social scientist. I'm interested in what different points of view are. There's you know, none of us have the sense that there, that there is some sort of um, absolute understanding of any of this. But I think that what we have to do 
is uh, create forums where we have dialogues about these issues, where we first of all acknowledge that the issues exist. And uh, this relates, to, I think, to Roberta's question. I mean, one of the problems we're dealing with today is the um, underfunding of things like social studies and history classes. And, and to the extent they were funded, the silences around black history uh, that have, um, or the um, the lost cause mythology around the Confederacy that has riddled our textbooks. And so we have all this work to do to kind of unlearn uh, a lot of the misinformation um, or to just learn the basic, you know, I had a student back in California, he's teaching California, who said to me after class one day, he said, yeah, you kept talking about Jim Crow today in class, but I didn't see Jim Crow's name on the syllabus. Was that an author we were supposed to read? I mean, this student, a college student, presumably one of the best and brightest in our country, did not understand that Jim Crow was a reference to the era of American apartheid. And I think that's indicative of just how much work we have to do to recover a memory that we've attempted to suppress. Yeah. Wow. So, um, I know we are just about, we're actually out of time, but um, I, I, I know if you, there was there a question you wanted to get to um, Shonda before we- yeah, wanted, um, Dr. Jeff and Shiraz, I want you to continue. Jessica's um, comment, who she's an assistant principal at our high school and does a lot with our professional development. And the second part of her question is, is how do we partner to incorporate your work into Kirkwood schools? Um, we have two courses in particular that um, are prime for this collaboration. I think both of you guys really talked about either who's missing from history and spaces, um, who's left out, and then also those distorted um, perceptions or patterns of people, exaggerations, and so people aren't really seen in their true life either. Um, you know, history is missing, it's inaccurate, or it's, it's offensive, you know? So can you kind of talk about how, as a school district, we might be able to incorporate some of this work um, into our school so students actually can help change the narrative moving forward? Yes, so um, I actually had the honor and pleasure of presenting at one of the Kirkwood High School, well, one of the Kirkwood Professional Development Days where the images that you all saw, which quite honestly, everybody, those images are not scratching the surface um, of the history of advertising. Um, and the derogatory images and how they actually craft narrative um, and belief systems on how we see and value and how we have dehumanized um, people of African descent and also people of Asian and Latinx descent, Hawaiian descent, you name it. Um, so I had the opportunity to present my workshop image control which goes through the history of advertising and how it impacts us currently. Um, and one of the charges that I issued to the teachers and the administrators, uh, which is a goal of that particular workshop, is about reclaiming narrative um, and allowing the students to be the teller of the story um, and to dismantle the false narratives and the tropes that actually have been put out there historically. Um, so, you know, I'm always game to come back out um, to Kirkwood to do things like that because our children to this day, you know, are still impacted by that, you know, and it's, it's something that needs to be resolved or we'll continue in this cycle. Yeah, I would, um, you know, also just offer to, you know, I, I don't want to pretend to have answers for how what would work best with Kirkwood schools. I think you all probably know that better than I do. I would just offer that I would be thrilled to have a relationship and um, work on some very concrete strategies, whether they're you know specific to certain classes you teach or um, um, other kinds of programming that might happen at the school. I would be, um, it would be my pleasure to be in dialogue about that. I came, I was telling Roberta yesterday, I, I, I moved from California to St. Louis, uh, Southern California a couple of years ago. Roberta looked, gave me this crazy look. I was like, why did you do that? Uh, but, I, but the reason is, one of the main reasons is because I wanted to be in a place where people wanted to have these conversations. And 
to do this work. I mean, I've been, I've dedicated most of my career, certainly the last decade, to studying histories and legacies of racial violence. And I'm at a point in my life and career where I really want to focus more on translating this work into practices that, that, that can be transformative and can be, um, that can help us heal. So this seemed to me a perfect place to come uh, to do that. I think that there are, um, you know, I'd also invite interested teachers, administrators, students to um, contact us about the Preparative Justice Coalition. And pretty soon we will have you know, a website and other, uh, you know, social media and stuff. So you can follow us. But if, if in the meantime, you'd like to be added to our listserv, you can just email either of us and we'll, ma we'll make sure you're added. But I just say get in touch and I'd, I'd be happy to come come to the school or virtually or physically and uh, and also to just work with teachers and students and in whatever ways we can, we can figure out. Wow, thank you. That's a, that's a bonus. I appreciate that. You, there's a wealth of, of knowledge that we all need on a regular basis, and we appreciate you taking the time to do that for us today. Uh, there are more questions, but unfortunately, we're not going to get to those questions. You all have um, um, in your chat, you can see that the emails are listed for both uh, Shiraz Gorman and uh, Dr. Jeff Ward, um, and he, they seem to be more than willing to answer questions and, and get involved. I, I appreciate that. I do want to say before I leave, next Tuesday, we'll have um, Jenna Knight of Liberty C Counseling and consulting and her topic is coping with convergence of historical trauma and recent traumatic experiences. So that is um, next week's topic and uh, hopefully you can tune in again. Um, all of these topics are a way for us to keep the conversation going. So thanks so much, uh, both of you. We appreciate everything that you've told us today and we look forward to um, maybe doing some sort of partnership with you all in the future. So thanks again. And I uh, thank everyone that was able to, to come on. This will be on Facebook Live and it'll also be on the district website if you want to go back and look at um, and review some more of this information. Thank you and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Ross. <laughs>